Hello and welcome to another instalment of our special Polish program, Pole Position, um, sponsored by or in association with BritishPoles.co.uk. Um, we just need to, Alina, um, yeah. we do need to mention we were wishing Paul well on Saturday when we were talking to the Hollands and um, we've just had the incredibly sad news that he passed away today. Um, so our thoughts go out to Molly. Um, her dad was a lovely, lovely man and he absolutely adored her um, and it's a very sad day for them. But in a, in keeping with our topic today, we're talking about the Warsaw Uprising and, and you have something you want to say before we start. I do, but just to add, Molly, we're thinking of you um, and yeah. Let's, um, let's, let's add, I just want to add <clears throat> a few things before we introduce our special guest today. I want to actually dedicate this podcast to first of all, my grandfather, Hirishad Langner, his pseudonym is Womich. He's my hero and one of the reasons that I am who I am today. And also to his incredible friends and fellow soldiers who he fought with that have unfortunately passed away over the past few months. Janusz Proszyński, uh, pseudonym Machnitsky, and Wiesław Gwiazdowski, his pseudonym Wiesiek. May you all rest in peace. So moving on from this very somber moment, I'd like to welcome our special guest today to talk about a subject that is incredibly close to my heart. It's the Warsaw Uprising, which began on the 1st of August, 1944. Wojciech Borodziej is a Polish historian and a writer specializing in Polish-German relations and a professor at the Warsaw University. He's written many books, some of which have been translated to English, for example, his book on the Warsaw Uprising. Thank you so much for joining us today to talk about this incredible subject. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, where are you? Are you in Warsaw? How is lockdown? Uh, the town is empty. It's uh, you speak <clears throat> with someone from a morning city uh, with empty streets, empty trams, uh, uh, only uh, basic shops and uh, pharmacies are open. I do want to say thank you. So enough about talking about lockdown. Let's get on to this incredibly interesting subject. Let's start with the most obvious question. What was the German occupation like for the Poles and Polish Jews in Warsaw? Uh, different. <clears throat> the Poles were prosecuted. Persecuted. Um, especially the members of the intelligentsia. Um, but not really um, designed to uh, to be killed, all of them, because the Germans need uh, labor. They need the, needed the resources um, of the country, especially in the agriculture. Um, so the poles were decimated, uh, so to speak, uh, from time to time, and the Jews within a year were separated from them. Uh, put into ghettos where the death rate uh, rose uh, within months to incredible highs and then in 42 they were deported to gas chambers. It's an incredibly hard and dark time of, of history. So how did the Warsaw Uprising come about and why, why did it start when it did? That's a rather complicated story. The Polish underground, which was quite powerful, maybe the most powerful after uh, Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union, um, was from the beginning planning uh, something like uh, 1918, when the German Empire collapsed and the Poles took over. Um, so the Polish underground from the beginning planned that one day this National Socialist regime will collapse and then uh, the weakened uh, German troops could be easily disarmed and sent back home. And then the unexpected situation occurred that in uh, June 44, the Red Army started their offensive in Belarus. And they not only destroyed, they annihilated the Heres Gruppe Mitte, which was something similar to Stalingrad, though it's forgotten. And they approached Warsaw very fast. 
uh, the Soviet tanks. And the idea was to um, launch the uprising first, um, fight the, against the Germans or disarm them, and then to receive uh, the Soviets as hosts in this city as representative, now it becomes complicated, uh, as representatives of a um, government in exile, which was not recognized by Moscow at this time. So this was the political clue behind it, um, that uh, the Warsaw Uprising should show the Soviets that there is a power representing the legal um, Polish uh, government and we are the hosts and that's why when when the red army tanks arrived southeast of uh, warsaw on july 13th on july uh, 31st uh, the decision was taken to launch the uprising on august 1st so <clears throat> what was called you our w in english can you tell us a little bit more about those first few hours of what the insurgents went through? It was a mess. Um, the insurgents uh, didn't have very many weapons because an uprising in Warsaw wasn't planned till March 44. It, uh, the weapons were um, dis dispersed all over the country, but not to Warsaw. So they were very badly equipped um, and they attacked all possible points, uh, some of them useless and suffered uh, heavy losses on the 1st of August. Uh, the hour W is uh, just a simple coincidence, it doesn't have any meaning. Um what were some of the important key points that they captured in those first few days? And Alina mentioned something about the power station earlier and that the story behind it is incredibly interesting. Can you tell us a bit more about it and why it was such a strategic point? Well, it was crucial to provide the city with uh, elementary elements of, uh, with elementary uh, ways of um, surviving like water and electricity. And that's why the attack was uh, also directed against uh, the electricity plant. Um, they succeeded so far and uh, succeeded in uh, holding it for a, some five weeks or so. Um, afterwards, uh, everything broke down. What are, what are the strategic points that they end up capturing apart from the power station? Uh, it, 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 it's not about strategy in terms of military uh, thinking. It's about supplying a city with some 800,000 people, uh, where a large part of the city is uh, uh, taken over by the insurgents because the German garrison is uh, quite modest, so to speak, uh, though very well uh, fortified. Um, and it has, has nothing to do with great politics. So between the, the 3rd and the 5th of August, the Germans committed, I mean, just reading some of the testimonies from this is just incredibly horrific, against uh, the civilian population of the Vola district. Could you explain to us more about what happened in those fateful few days? It was uh, German and auxiliary troops uh, mostly former Soviet uh, citizens um, <clears throat> who just went into the district where there was hardly any unit of the uh, Armia Krajowa, of the Home Army, and they simply started murdering everyone on the street, in the hospitals, in the churches, and the private flats. Um, we can't really explain what happened there. Um, and around uh, August 5th, um, the Germans discovered uh, that it was a non, uh, it didn't really help them because the news spread around and the inhabitants of Warsaw 
uh, were very much more convinced that the uprising was a good thing. So they stopped this mass shooting. We don't know, it's about 20, 40,000 people killed within 40 hour, 48 hours without any sense, uh, of course, without any morality behind. Is this, did this happen because of Himmler's order when the uprising broke out? Maybe, but uh, we don't know it for sure. The German archives were destroyed and we know only about uh, the local commanders who apparently uh, didn't care very much about what, uh, what they received. Um, I've read somewhere that there were allied airdrops into Warsaw. Did they help the Home Army last as long as it did? And, and if so, why or why not? Well, the British, uh, the Royal Air Force did whatever they could. Uh, they lost some 50% of, uh, uh, of the flights to Warsaw of the sorties. Um, <clears throat> and the only way to help uh, was... Uh, the Americans. The Polish lost about 80% flying to Warsaw. Um, if I could please uh, uh, read you uh, something from the memoirs of Gen George F. Okay, so George F. Cannon, who was number two at the American Embassy in Moscow in 1944, and he certainly was no friend of the Soviets. Um, knew that uh, the only way the Allied could help the Warsaw Uprising was the so-called frantic uh, schedule, which meant that uh, American B-17 crossed over Europe and landed on Soviet airports. They couldn't fly back. And then uh, this issue was so important uh, that it needed to be presented by Stalin in person, to Stalin in person. The American ambassador and the chief of the American military mission in Moscow went off to the Kremlin and got a flat refusal. And George Cannon recalled it the following way. I was personally not present at this fateful meeting with Stalin and Molotov. But I can recall the appearance of the ambassador and General Dean, who was the military attaché, um, as they returned in the wee hours of the night, shattered by the experience. There was no doubt in any of our minds to the implication of the position the Soviet leaders had taken. We refused. This was a gauntlet thrown down in a spirit of malicious glee before the Western powers. What it was meant to imply was, quote, we intend to have Poland lock, stock, and barrel. We don't care a fig for those Polish underground fighters who have not accept communist authority. To us, they are no better than the Germans. And if they and the Germans slaughter each other off, so much the better. It is a matter of indifference to us what you Americans think of all this. You are going to have no part in determining the affairs of Poland from here on out, and it's time you realized it. I have no words. I've never heard that before, and that is that's chilled me a little bit listening to, to the words of of George what Kennedy. truly happened. Oh my gosh, sorry. <laughs> take a moment to absorb that <clears throat> but <clears throat> sorry apologies the the uprising was not meant to last as long as it actually did <clears throat> it was supposed to last only a few days and it ended up lasting obviously 63 but during your research were there any heroic acts that came to mind something that stands out for you well more or less uh, <clears throat> All people involved, starting from the fighters, uh, going on to children, women, uh, the elder people who were totally helpless, and to these uh, pilots who flew from Polish and British. 
from Brindisi all over Europe uh, with the hope of survival of some 50% with each sort. That's it's incredible. Do you have anything you, uh, that stands out for you in your research, um, particularly in terms of women and children? What was their experience of this? Horrible. I mean, the children didn't understand very much about what was happening. They just understood that it's uh, something very bad. Um, women, some of them, 10% of the insurgents were uh, female. Um, but... F- most of Warsaw uh, women were not uh, members of the insurgents and they just had to suffer uh, to take care about water, uh, something to eat, uh, shelter. Terrible, 63 days, days long. My, grand, my great-grandmother actually was one of the women who fought um, in the uprising. Unfortunately, she perished during a bombing of Mokotov in September. Mm-hmm. And um, she was actually the head nurse uh, of a field hospital there, which um, she obviously didn't get to say goodbye to my grandfather while he was fighting over in Povishna, which is down by the river for people who don't know where Warsaw is, uh, set down in the central park. So listening to, to this sort of thing about the women, the children, the salvation, it kind of brings it a little bit home, unfortunately. But I do want to add, because I tweet a lot, I spend a lot of time on Twitter, I spend a lot of time on social media. My favourite thing to do when I go to Warsaw is to look at the buildings, the old buildings, everything that was pre-World War II, things that stood in Warsaw during the uprising, things that survived. And unfortunately... There's a lot of people that stalk me on social media and tell me that I'm wrong and that I don't know what I'm talking about and that Warsaw was completely razed to the ground. I want to know from an actual expert that has written a book on this subject, how much of the city was actually destroyed and how many lives were truly lost? We can't tell it exactly. Um... My guesstimate is that Warsaw wasn't much more destroyed than, say, Hamburg during the Allied bombing in '43. Um, on the Eastern Bank, uh, there was hardly any destruction because the uprising didn't happen there. Um, and that's basically one third of the city. Um, in the center, the destruction was enormous. And after the uprising, the Germans uh, did really everything to destroy any signs of of Polish culture, like libraries, like palaces, like churches, and so on. So here the losses were uh, probably about 60, 70, 80 percent, no one knows. And in the western outskirts where the uprising uh, took place only for, for, for a few days, uh, they were considerably less. So I, I would my my guesstimate again is that uh, something like seventy percent of Warsaw was destroyed. And in terms of human lives, we are not sure uh, as well. Could have been about one hundred fifty thousand people, most of them, of course, civilians. I really want to say thank you for this because. People have been telling me that I'm wrong and I don't know what I'm talking about. So Mm -hmm. there you go. To those people that have been telling me that I'm wrong and incorrect, you've just heard it from an expert. So thank you very much. Welcome. Looking at this from a different perspective, did the Germans expect an uprising and how did the Soviets respond to it? Well, about the Soviets, uh, everything is in this... um, a cable from Ken Anor in his memoirs where he describes the visit of the American ambassador and the military attaché at, uh, at, uh, in Stalin's residence. Um, the Soviets um, didn't really have anything against that Germans and Poles slaughtered in themselves off. Um, they didn't need the Germans nor the Poles. And uh, the German authorities, they knew about the uprising. They were quite well informed 
prepared. Um, and the German troops, which were not very many, something between 15 and 20,000 in Warsaw on the 1st of August, um, they were not taken by surprise. They fired back immediately. I want to add a, con a controversial question <clears throat> into the mix because a lot of, especially during the uprising memorials and the commemorations, this question comes up quite a lot. And I'm interested in hearing your opinion on this because obviously I, I have mine and unfortunately I've clashed with other people on theirs. Basically, it, some people consider it a mistake launching the uprising. And what are your thoughts on this? Well, there are two ways to uh, look at this uh, historical event. Uh, one is the Czech way. In Prague, the uprising was really symbolical. Um, the city was preserved. Nothing really important happened. In Poland, it, in Warsaw, it was the destruction of a city. It was the destruction of the biggest resistance in this uh, part of Europe and the death of more than 100,000 civilians. And it's a question whether you prefer to have your capital preserved or your honor. A question which I can't really answer. No, that makes that that's understandable. For me personally, I, I believe it wasn't it wasn't a mistake and it was inevitable. Uh, it was gonna happen one way or another. People may disagree with me, but I am happy to stick to my guns on this one. Yes, I mean, that's a legitimate point of view. But uh, still, uh, no one knows uh, if there were no, um, if there was no uprising in Warsaw, uh, how would Poland look like in '45? Somehow different, but we don't know how. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Alina, have you got anything else you want? I know this is such a personal subject to you. Is there anything else you want to ask? I do want to say thank you very much for supporting some of my points of view. Um, it has made me feel much stronger on the subject and given me the ability to pursue maybe some articles or things in English um, and pursue this further. So thank you. It was a pleasure. It was a very emotional interview. Thank you. I think um, next week, finally, Alina, we get to your research um, on pole position and we're going to do a programme with you about the first mass transport to Auschwitz in the summer of 1940, which I'm really looking forward to because it's about time you got to tell people what it is as a historian that you focus on. Um, join us later on today uh, when we will be talking to Catherine Fletcher about The Beauty and the Terror, which is her new book about the Italian Renaissance. Um, and then we're geared up for the Easter weekend after that. Uh, we bring you Dan Snow on Saturday. We bring you Sean Bean on Sunday. And we continue our theme for Sharp's reunion on Easter Monday. Um, so join us then remember stay safe um, if you possibly can stay at home this is Nighthawk signing off <laughs>